learned to play an instrument, learned a second language, applied to college, applied for a loan, started a business, started a blog, shared a picture, shared a moment. Turn your wish list into a checklist with internet essentials from Comcast. When you're connected, you're ready for anything. Hello. He could shred metal harder than any of these knuckleheads with the, the big beards and the tattoos. I have heard the people criticize me, and I have to admit, I agree with them. I think it was probably inevitable for me to make work that was about what was going on around me. I think as an artist, you really have to kind of challenge those boundaries. I have complex regional pain syndrome type 2. I mean, after the accident, his body hurts. I just want the pain to go away. We get an ID with our mind over. Exposure therapy is basically introducing the individual to their memories. Virtual reality is kind of an augmented exposure experience. We spend our time saying that music is connecting us to the world. And the most inspiring place where youth is embracing this music is in China. Hello, I'm Ivan Wiener, Executive Director of the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience. Welcome to AFMX 2020, the virtual edition. As COVID-19 impacted so many festivals around the world, we are very fortunate and happy to be able to present an incredible program, thanks to our sponsors and our volunteers. Because of them, we're able to continue our tradition of bringing together filmmakers, musicians, students, and an entire community to share stories and collaborate into the future. This year, we have 73 incredible film projects with filmmakers doing live Q and A's after their screenings. We also have our intimate conversation series that we'll be offering for free through Facebook Live. Please go to our website, abqfilmx.com, get your tickets for all of the events, see where you need to go for the free ones, and share with all of your friends on social media. It's going to be a week to remember. You can also make a small contribution through the ticketing pages for any of the events to the AFME Foundation. Finally, I'd like to thank our core team of staff members and volunteers who have worked so hard to bring the virtual experience to life. Kira, Ariella, Carly, Cindy, Shane, Sabrina, Barbara, Jerry, Sean, and Sam, this fest is for you. And it's for all of the volunteers who have contributed over the past eight years of AFMX. From all of us at the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience, thank you. Now, let's fest.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Albuquerque Film and Music Experiences Intimate Conversation with Mr. Stuart Lyons. Stuart, good morning, afternoon, good morning. Or just still morning where you are. Uh, welcome. Thank you for thank you for, thank you for uh, coming on today. Um, well, I'm going to start off by saying we're all very lucky to have you uh, as one of the conversations this year. Um, it's a little different. Uh, normally, we'd be on stage, but I think this is going on. Uh, this is going off really well. Um, I'm going to give the audience just a real quick bio on you, and I'll have you fill a few things in there. Sure. Uh, okay, everyone. Stuart Lyons is an Emmy Award-winning line producer of Breaking Bad, as well as the co-executive co producer for the premiere season of Better Call Saul. He has, a, he has extensive production experience with major studios, networks, cable, and streaming television companies, including Netflix, Sony Pictures Television, Warner Brothers, Amazon, HBO, NBC, and CBS. He's worked on 32 television series, 28 pilots, 20 of which were ordered to series, and a dozen of feature and television movies as a producer, director, writer, production manager, and assistant director. In all, his screen credits total more than 600 episodes of television shows. He's also analyzed, scheduled, and or budgeted over 100 television pilots for every major network as well. Uh, also for, for networks like HBO, Stars, and AMC. He received his BFA from NYU Fish School of the Arts and his MBA from NYU Stern School of Business. He's also a graduate of the Directors Guild of America Assistant Director Training Program. Now, we, we all know him from Breaking Bad, but you might also know him from his previous work on other popular television series like Taxi, Everybody Loves Raymond, and Cagney and Lacey. Quite the bio you got there, Stuart. Uh, anything I missed that you want to add in there? No, it's all good. That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, you Just know, make first, you get tired. That's right. That's right. Um, I did want to start off with, uh, you know, for those tuning in who might not understand, can you break down for us the difference between a producer, a line producer, and a unit production manager? Okay. Um, there's a bit of overlap in some of those, uh, those jobs. Uh, specifically, let's, let's just take it from the line producer. Um, the line producer is the person who is making or supervising all of the arrangements necessary to make a project that would be uh, obtaining crew, facilities, equipment, overseeing the budget and the schedule, and acting as the principal interface between the production department of studios or networks uh, and the show. Um, and and just basically being the chief uh, CEO of, of the show. Uh, creative decisions are largely the province of the, the writers in television uh, who are also usually given producing titles. Uh, so it can get pretty confusing and, and it gets confusing between what happens between features and television. So it's almost like in order to understand who's doing what on a show, you actually pretty much have to talk to people on the show to, to find out. So there's no universal thing. The UPM or unit production manager is the person who is basically handling uh, all the show details in production, not post-production, but in production uh, for the line producer. Uh, the assistant director, uh, you know, it's crew, it's uh, union regulations, it's, uh, it used to be safety, although now safety is going through a slightly different uh, uh, path with COVID. Um, and just setting up the show. Every show is almost like a, um, a startup company. You start, nobody's on a, a regular salary. We're all gig employees. Uh, I've, I think out of my over 40 years in show business, I've only been on salary for maybe a year, year and a oh, half. Wow. Everything else has been on a project by project basis. Producing, uh, the producer title is pretty fluid. In television, it can apply to a lot of writers in, uh, or it can apply to people who hold gateway positions. For example, access to talent. They might be the managers of a director, managers of a writer, managers of a star who are given uh, producing titles uh, as well. It's a bit of a fluid, certainly confusing for outsiders to, to navigate through, but they're generally the, the actual physical responsibility for making the show, not the creative responsibility, falls to the line producer. To the line producer. And I noticed there was no uh, subject of financing in there. 
television as opposed to film, why did you not talk about financing? Um, financing is really much more of a function of the feature producers um, who need to, in many cases, in independent productions, actually raise the money. Uh, I spend money. Good. And my, my goal is, is always, I'm going to spend it as, as smartly as I can. I'm not going to save anything. Uh, that's, that's not saving money is not putting it on the screen. I want to really come in a dollar under what the studio gives me to make the show with. So financing for television is, is up till now. Uh, I'm not saying you can't do a spec project because uh, there are no rules, but I get involved when a project is fully funded and essentially has an air date. So we are often running from the moment uh, the phone rings and the agent confirms that, uh, that uh, I should get on a plane. You heard it, everyone. Stuart Lyons, Stuart Lyons spends money. That's I what spend he does. That's I've what never does. raised a dime for a project. So Interesting. It's, Interesting. It's, uh, all, all, all of the work has been on fully funded shows, which is not everybody's experience, to be sure. Sure. Okay, well, uh, this next part here, I, uh, well, let me start off by saying, you know, everyone knows you were a line producer, but not what, what people might not know is that you were the only person involved with Breaking Bad to be on set every single day of all 62 episodes. And that is, that is quite a feat. That is quite a feat. Uh, and in honor of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the James Lipton treatment here in honor of you having a career of fielding questions. So let's get through this and then we'll get to the, the entree of the conversation. But uh, Stuart Lyons, are you ready? Yeah. The Beatles or the Stones? Beatles. Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin? Uh, Keaton. Sean Connery or Roger Moore? Mm, Sean. Superman or Batman? Batman. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Dishes or laundry? Uh, dishes. Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune? Jeopardy. Oh, that was, oh, no, no, that that was a definite right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Super Bowl or World Cup? Uh, I'm not a sports fan. You heard it, everyone. <laughs> I'll, watch the, I'll watch the Super Bowl, but I'll watch it mostly for commercials. That makes sense coming from you. Mac or PC? Oh, PC. Uh, excuse me, Mac. What am I Mac. talking about? Caffeinated drink of choice. Coffee. Are you the kind of guy who ponders life's mysteries at sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Do you read the newspaper? Every day. Last book you read? Ooh, there's a thing. Uh, the last book I read, because I read tremendously online and I mostly need, read journals and things like that. So the last book I read, let me see if I get that title. Okay, I, I read a, a movie project uh, based on a book called uh, No Summit Out of Sight. No Summit Out of Sight. Yeah. But a lot of your time is spent by trades and the news. Uh, news, yes. Trades, yes. Yeah. Okay. Try and stay current. Uh, first film you saw in a theater? Swiss Family Robinson. Disney's Swiss Family Robinson. I remember, right? Disney's. Uh... Mm -hmm. A good one, I like that. Uh, last film you saw in a theater? Oh gosh, I'm just trying to think. I'm gonna have to take a, a pass on pass on that. Oh, we'll, we'll let uh, that one stoop. Probably, uh, uh, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Summersby, the uh, Summer's Day, it was a film about a cult. Oh, Midsummer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Midsummer, thank you. Midsummer, what still, a movie, huh? That's an experience, yeah. yeah. Still nightmares. Uh, at the theater, what are you getting at the concession stand? Nothing. Would you purchase the 3D option at the theater if it was available? No. Theater or at home experience? Depends on the movie. Depends on the movie. Star Wars or Star Trek? I would have Star Wars. 
Godfather one or Godfather two? Two. Vertigo or North by Northwest? North by Northwest. Favorite Halloween movie? I, um, not my genre. We'll pass. Uh, favorite Christmas movie? <laughs> not my religion. <laughs> Breakfast with <laughs> Cary Grant or Jimmy Stewart? I think I like uh, Jimmy. Lunch with Walter Matthau or Walter Cronkite? Cronkite. Dinner with Betty White or Jack Black? I'll take Betty. Take Betty. Happy Days or The Wonder Years? Um, happy Days. The Office or Parks and Rec? Office. Friends or Seinfeld? Seinfeld. What show do you feel should have continued? Mine. <laughs> what show do you feel should have ended sooner? Uh, ended sooner, Battlestar Galactica. Television show you wish you could have been a part of? Oh gosh, so many. Um, the Wire. The Wire. First analysis of a script, is it printed or is it digital for you? Oh, it's, it's now everything is digital. You won't print it out for your old school sense of, but no, just it's no. always digital. No, okay. no. I, um, I'm, I complete everything digitally. I haven't printed out a script probably in at least half a dozen years, maybe more. So, no. Would you rather a slug line that reads interior or exterior? Would I rather have a slug line that reads interior or exterior? On the production side of things. Um, from the production, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm, I'm You're neutral. Care. Yeah, I want to know what it's saying for the script. Good. Do you wear a watch on set? Yes. Is it digital or is it analog? Analog. That's analog, everyone. Would you rather a call or text? Call. Call. That's what are you looking for at craft services? Old school indeed. Yeah, that's old school. Well, what you're looking for in craft services then and what you're looking for now are two very different things. It used to just be an open buffet. And what I was looking for then was cleanliness, uh, taste, uh, quantity, uh, presentation. So I was, I was wanting the crew to feel welcomed and supported uh, on the show. I wasn't looking for them to find something in common to complain about. Now, safety is, is, is and health are, are the most important things about the presentation. So it's a more, much more complicated uh, situation. Certainly the open buffet is no longer possible. Right. Uh, won't be possible for a while. Good answer. Uh, on set pet peeve. Conversations around uh, a playback. What personality trait in your colleagues turns you off the most? Entitlement. I've heard you have an interesting way of keeping fit on set. What's your method and when did it begin? Well, it's the slightly offset. I have, uh, when I was doing Breaking Bad, I got a walking desk. So it was my, my office desk was mounted over a treadmill and I would walk uh, while I was either reading scripts or breaking things down or signing checks. And uh, my goal was to walk virtually from Albuquerque to back to Los Angeles. And I got 710 of the 800 miles done wow. by the time I was done. There's still time, Stuart. There's still time. <laughs> You've said that creative people like choices rather than limits. You need yes. to develop multiple solutions to any problem. Number 43, you're breaking down a pilot script for HBO. You're 12 pages in when you read, through the mist, the tired sailor sees it, Moby Dick frozen in an iceberg. What are your initial thoughts when breaking this down? Oh, well, that's obviously going to be CGI. So my, my thoughts are, you know, through the mist, I guess we're on the Pequod and we're looking, we're looking into the, into the distance. So I've got to start making arrangements with uh, getting bids from digital houses um, 
I need to talk to the director about, of course, what he or she sees, uh, you know, um, is the, what features of the whale do we pick out? Uh, what's the time of day that we're seeing it? I'm, I'm trying to visualize what the audience is going to be presented with and expediting that. So I'm thinking of the full, full round on it. Do I need to get plates of the ocean? Do I need to be on the ocean to do this? I hope not. Uh, and what else does it go with? Since most of that movie is set on the boat, I'm probably going, probably going to be building that uh, several decks of that boat and uh, against either LED playback or green screen, however they, the cinematographer and the post people recommend it. So um, a simple shot breaks down in my mind to a lot of different steps and um, how, to, how to achieve that. Perfect. In the dead of winter, four kids with an attitude problem sneak onto your set and drop M80s in the porta potties, which blow up. What's your first call? Who's your first call and why? <laughs> well, what happened to security? I mean, that, that they let them onto there, but the, assuming that they've managed to evade security and they've blown up the porta potties, the first thing I'd be doing is getting a couple of the mobile dressing rooms moved closer to the set to take up the. Uh, to slack and to just to keep shooting. And then of course, we would be alerting our, um, our uh, security team to, to increase the uh, watchfulness. Or hiring new security, right? Yeah, I'm, uh, right there. That to happen. <laughs> uh, it's Friday and there's a motorcycle rally of 10,000 headed for your set. Who's your first call and why? Well, one of the responsibilities of the location department is to understand what's going to be happening in the environment around you at the time that you're filming. So a surprise, uh, a surprise appearance by 10,000 motorcycle people would really be dropping the, the ball there. But let's hope that we have enough stuff that's MOS without sound that we can continue to be productive while we, while, while we deal with the, the show. Um, I'd be probably contacting the local police to make sure that at least as far as we could tell, our sight lines are protected. And then I'd be exploring cover sets. You know, if it's going to be impossible to shoot outside, where can I move the company to to continue the work of the show? Perfect. And don't forget, everyone tuning in, we are going to have a session of uh, audience questions also. So be typing those in. I'm looking forward to asking Stuart some of these. So think hard. Uh, a mighty wind from the West knocks your two leads into each other and they're unconscious. There's no hospital for 237 miles. Who is your first call and why? Well, we have onset medics uh, all the time and we have had them since COVID. So the first thing I'd wanted to know is what is the condition of the two actors? Do I have two equal concussions? Uh, do I have somebody who's beginning to bleed uh, from the ears? I mean, who, what is going to be the priority? Obviously, we're going to try and get a medevac helicopter to deal with both of them as quickly as possible. So that would be the first call. There's usually um, some safety uh, personnel with very good connections on um, and security people with very good connections to handle most emergencies at the major studios. So if I, I would know who that person was, uh, you know, prior to uh, the production. Their number would, would be with me all the time, and I would be alerting that person to take care of the safety issues once uh, and the health issues. Once that's done, I have a list of people that I need to inform, including the production executive on the show, uh, so that they can disseminate the the information. This. You know, that situation may be imaginary, but people do get hurt on, on sets. And so it's important that the people know who's supposed to make the call, that not everybody does everything uh, simultaneously and duplicatively. Um, I'm not sure I, that was a word, but- uh, It is now. It is now, okay. Uh, that nobody duplicates the other person's activities uh, so that we, we get a, um, we get a, a real efficient, safe response as quickly as possible. So I could take away from these four questions is hire the right people. 
to do their job. Uh, well, you're always supposed to. Yeah. 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 Um, you try to hire people who, who understand what their responsibilities are. And uh, part of making sure that that's the case is to, is to interview properly and to present scenarios uh, and to discuss how things are, are going, going to, to work. Now, look, people can get injured in non-stunt situations uh, and have, but if you're doing a very high level stunt very frequently, uh, you will have the, an ambulance standing by in case of, of an issue. Now, by standing by, generally <laughs> it's not in the view of the people doing the stunt because that's, that's just rude uh, <laughs> and, and kind of a hex, but you would have people standing by ready to, to handle uh, and expedite whatever contingency happened. Should occur. That's great. The actual owners of Walter White's house here in Albuquerque had to erect a six foot tall wrought iron fence due to the throwing of a particular cuisine. Stuart, what does your pizza of choice consist of? Margarita or uh, so meatballs, all the veggies in the world. It's my favorite food. There it is. The Breaking Bad RV tour, the $75. What would you hope would be on it? <laughs> well, I think uh, you'd want to see uh, certainly the Walter White House. You'd want to see the uh, car wash. You might want to go up to the reservoir, which was the place of uh, where people got picked up and looked really strange. I'm not sure you could go see the Red Rock Canyons in Tahajali, which I've just found particularly in incredibly beautiful. And, and we were very fortunate to, to have uh, the permission of the Navajo uh, tribe there to, to shoot. Uh, and they were very gracious uh, for all the years of the show. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we can go through um, the, the um, you know, by Jesse's house, although those people uh, weren't um, as happy. Uh, they went through three or four owners while we were shooting. While you were shooting. Some, huh? some of the owners loved it, some of the owners didn't, uh, the attention, but uh, you could see that. It's been remodeled extensively since uh, we shot there. Um, the, some of the downtown offices, uh, you know, the Albuquerque streets that we, we, we filmed at. It's, it's an amazing city. Um, I miss it. Yeah. Uh, the Sandia Peak Tramway here is $25 for a round trip. Have you taken it? Three times. Is it worth it? Yes. That was easy. Yeah. All right, here we go, Stuart. Favorite place to eat in New Mexico? Oh, uh, well, let's see. I like Farina because I told you I was very much a pizza fan. Mm -hmm. Zinc. And uh, let's see, I um, I really like divey New Mexican uh, cafes. I think they're greasy spoons. Yeah, greasy right spoons. there with you. They're, they're right there. Order Christmas and and you're you're all set. Albuquerque or Santa Fe? Well, I'm not going to answer that one. <laughs> That's fair. I this. I think that that Albuquerque is is wonderful, and I and and we could not have had a better home for our show. Um, I'm into art, uh, so I, I do like Santa Fe's art art uh, scene very much, and of course, the cuisine in, in Santa Fe is just spectacular. So I, I you know I just am in, kind of in love with New Mexico. So, so you could almost break that into business and pleasure or the other way around between the oh, two? Okay. A, a, little, a little of both and both. Of both. It's, you know, it's, I love skiing there, so it's all good. Uh, this comes compliments of Ann Lerner, the city uh -oh. of Albuquerque's film liaison during the production of Breaking Bad, who is a uh, great resource to you and an even greater yes. friend, I understand. Um, have you ever considered buying a home in New Mexico? I, we came very close to buying a home. Very, very close. Um, we actually put a bid in. On a, on a house. Oh, wow. Things fell through, and, uh, and then we decided to stay in, in the Los Angeles area. But uh, it, it was quite close for a while. 
I was there almost nine years. Yeah, you were. There's, and again, there's still time, Stuart. There's still time. <clears throat> uh, favorite subject in school growing up? Science. Second history. Third English. History and English. Uh, what was your first job in life? In life? I was a janitor in a shoe factory. Write that script, Stuart. <laughs> Write that script right now. Uh, other was, professions you considered? Oh, gosh. Uh, law would have been uh, one of them. Teaching, which I still very much am, am involved with and enjoy doing. Um, you know, certainly concentrating on writing rather than production uh, was uh, another possibility. Good. So, if it was your call, film or digital? Digital. We can open on that later. Uh, number 62, everyone, in honor of Stuart Lyon's 62 episode stint on Breaking Bad, red or green chili? Christmas. Christmas. Uh, Stuart, that was to show how quickly you could answer 62 questions in, oh, I don't know. What was that? It's probably 20 minutes. So hey. I know you get a little bit of that every day. and. Um, we can get into the, the entree now, but uh, sure. like all great stories, we humanize the hero. I thought we'd humanize you a little bit. I know a little bit about you. I know what to get you. Pizza. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, a uh, little bit on career. After your training and education, what point did you seek representation and how important is that to you right now? I didn't seek representation for my production work until pretty far along in my career uh, when I was... Uh, you know, I, I, I really came up um, step by step. You know, I, I, I say I, I skyrocketed to the middle. Uh, you know, I was a, a second AD, then a first AD, then a UPM. Uh, there was a time when I was directing and I had representation for that. There was a time when I was writing features. I had representation for that. I started um, really getting work as a producer uh, representation pretty late, probably maybe only 15 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, Jason Pagney is, is my agent now at William Morris. Uh, he's terrific. If I had had him earlier in my career, um, I would have still hoped that I wound up on Breaking Bad, but I'm sure there would have been a lot of other excellent choices because he's, he's just terrific in finding um, good work. And in that good work, your process of, uh, of choosing a project, what's that like for you? Are, is, it, is it by taste? Is it for money? Is it, is it uh, personal attachment to it? What, how are you choosing your projects that you become a part of? Um, you know, to, to some extent, I'm a slut. Hey. Um, you know, they show up with a check and uh, I'm, 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 I'm there I'm, and happy to, to be there. They, you know, as, as you go further in your career, hopefully you get more choices, but, uh, you know, certainly raising a family and, uh, you know, having the responsibilities of uh, being an adult, you don't always get all the choices. I like to, to work on projects that, that are subjects that appeal to me. I, I don't necessarily want to be part of a horror movie or a uh, certainly not a slasher film uh, at this point, and try not to repeat uh, stories. So uh, all those great scripts with people who start off low-level drug dealing and then work their way to the top, um, I think they should find somebody who could be truly enthusiastic about uh, doing that show. I like it. You've stated in the past that one of the most important things in one's career is to be the solution to someone else's problem, being, uh, being valuable in that way. Can you give us a concrete example of something in your career that played out that way? Well, I think that basically it's, what you're trying to do, I mean, people hire us, we're uh, line producers. We're not the creative producers from, from the beginning. Uh, people like Mark Johnson um, behind Breaking Bad, 
um, and certainly Vince Gilligan, who also had the chief creative role uh, for the for all of Breaking Bad and and for the, certainly the beginning of the Better Call Saul. Um, so we are there to solve problems. We are there to figure out how to get the biggest and best show for the amount of money and time that we're given to, to do it in and to make great use of the resources. So that's what I, I really mean by being a, a solution. Um, as, as your career progresses and you get more experience, you should become more valuable to as a person to hire. It, it, that should be true. Of course, it makes it difficult for people who are starting off to compete uh, against experienced people. But sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's also a chemistry thing. You, you have to get the, the confidence and the trust of the people that you're doing all this work for, uh, the director, the producers, uh, the producers, the studio, uh, and to some extent, the actors in front of the camera. You have to have, they have to know that their interests are foremost uh, in your mind as, as you try and get the project going. In your 47 years of production management, 47 plus, what regrets do you have in your career thus far? I know, I know that, that word regrets, you'll, some might say, I don't have any regrets, otherwise I might not be here. But, but do you have a genuine regret? Maybe not that it was a mistake, but that you do regret something. Oh gosh, you know, I I, I try not to dwell on those things, so it's very hard to just sort of uh, of to pull them up. Um, look, everybody uh, on a show is human, and they're also working under sometimes physically difficult conditions uh, in terms of weather, uh, psychologically uh, difficult situations in terms of stress and and pressure. So. Yeah, there've been times where, where the interactions weren't as, uh, maybe as considerate as they, they should have been. But uh, fortunately they're few and far between and, uh, and certainly became fewer as, as I would understand the position better. Um, you don't get anything out of, out, of, out of losing your temper or yelling at anybody. That is just, the, once that happens, you've lost. And uh, that's that's never to never to be uh, in, engaged in. Uh, that's an indulgence um, that you really can't permit yourself. Good. What are your thoughts about production startups throughout the country right now? And do you feel like the industry is ready? Well, I think it's an extremely challenging time, uh, to say the least. I don't know that true safety is going to be possible prior to a vaccine. Um, I think we're going to do the best we can. And I think that um, there are shows where people understand that responsibility for to protect the show and to protect each other. Um, there certainly have been a lot of occasions where I felt I've been working with people who were willing to sacrifice um, safety sometimes or try to um, because that's not something I permit um, you know to to expedite a shot um, it's it's a very difficult work environment I don't think people who have not worked on a set understand realistically how physically demanding it can be for literally everybody from the drivers who whose day may spend six, 17, 18 hours, uh, makeup and hair, not too far beyond behind that. Uh, of course, wardrobe, not too far behind that. And assistant directors, there's no, there's very little work-life balance. So understanding that that's going to be the situation and it's going to be physically taxing and you have to do great work all the time because that's just the nature of the beast. People need to, to know that about uh, working on a movie or a television show. You've expressed a great appreciation and trust in the New Mexico crew base. What about New Mexico crew? What is it about New Mexico crews that makes you feel this way? Well, it, it's fun. I mean, I, to, to some extent, uh, when I came in Breaking Bad, which was in 2007, 
there had been, I think, one pretty, uh, you know, like a Saturday morning TV series shot here. And this was kind of the place to do lower budget or lower priority kinds of shoots for the most part. So what was really a lot of fun was to come into this situation with a television series and say to the people that I was interviewing, we might be working together for five or six years. You've only done assignments that lasted three to six weeks. Right. We have to treat this uh, as, a, as, as a mutual thing in which at the end of the deal making, we both have to be happy because it's gonna continue for years if we're lucky. And that's different than the kind of gotcha on a for cheap uh, attitude that can sometimes be prevalent in uh, lower budget uh, features. So there were uh, the other part that is great about TV is that you know when you're doing a feature and you're only in for six eight weeks, you really need you, you don't take any chances. You you can't develop talent in that period of time. But in television, when you're going from season to season, you can see people who are terrific and who are ready to move up a notch. And you can give them that chance because they're not an unknown to you, you know? And giving, uh, we went from about 60% by headcount New Mexican uh, labor. Now the headcount, it's a kind of a wonky way to measure it because you got a lot of drivers and you get a lot of people in construction. Uh, but the key people in the beginning of the show were from uh, outside New Mexico. By the end of the show, we had half the camera crew, all of the grip, all of the electric, the sound department, uh, makeup and hair, uh, most of wardrobe, virtually all of construction, every Teamster, they were all residents of New Mexico. They were New Mexico people who went, at one point we were over 90% New Mexican labor. So to take the show in that direction and to give those opportunities to people was really a pleasure. I mean, there are people who are, you know, who started as PAs who are first assistant directors now. Um, and some of them, we got into the union. There are people in the camera local, and, but virtually in every local. That was, as much as doing a great show was important, that's really the, the kind of lasting legacy that I, I enjoy. And I'm still in contact with a lot of these, these people. They're great people, really great people, and top, top professionals. I'm sure they like hearing that. Uh, this is a two-part in relation to, to, this, to this question you just answered. Um, there's been an explosion of film and television productivity for the last... 15 years here in New Mexico, thanks to its incentive, crews, and infrastructure. Now, how long will it take, if ever, for New Mexico to be used for its above-the-line talent, writers, directors, producers? That's A. And is it fair or realistic for New Mexico talent to want or even hope for this? Well, it's certainly fair for them to want to hope for it. The, the, the issue is, is what kind of projects are you trying to do and the nature of how projects come together. Look, if you want to be a writer in television and doing television series, you pretty much have to move to Los Angeles. And if you don't do that, then you better be insanely talented. I don't think betting on being insanely talented is a good bet. Okay. So you go to where you know, what do they say? The, uh, the room where it happens. Well, the city where television is put together is by and large Los Angeles. I'm not saying that there isn't some stuff that is created in New York, but even Atlanta, which has a tremendous amount of production, the productions are developed in other places. So if you want to be on the crew, you can go to those places. That's great. If you want to be creatively where it happens, which is to me to be a writer or a director or an actor, then fairly quickly, you're gonna to wanna to have a presence uh, primarily in LA or possibly New York, because that's where the decision makers are gathering their, their people. Now, you write a feature movie uh, and it's set in New Mexico and you're in New Mexico and you can raise the funding for that, then, 
you've achieved what you, you wanted to achieve. Sure. But uh, I think that with the advent of streaming television, particularly, there will be more local productions, but even those local productions will be approved of and the creative people will be placed by people living in Los Angeles for the most part. Despite uh, any incoming studios or facilities for, for, for a long time to come, you think that? Yeah. You know that, you know that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a certain scale uh, of production that you can get going in New Mexico. But at that point, you are writing specifically for a smaller market. So you can't realistically expect the kinds of budget and resources, right. talent resources that uh, can be found in, in other places. I, look, all movies are, are miracles. <laughs> <laughs> like that. You heard it, people. They really are. They, 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 getting them together and getting them funded, getting them approved, getting them shot. It's just, uh, it's, it's really hard work. Uh, television is a bit more predictable because they have to put stuff on. And that demands commitments to production. Um, uh, I see the tendency or I see the trend in streaming is to go for um, nationalities in terms of now Netflix is producing in Germany. It's producing, uh, I believe in India. I know that they've been producing works in China and, and Korea uh, and in you know, Spain. And I think they have uh, productions in, in France uh, and they have international executives who go there whether they, they're going to specific cities to determine that. Um, most of those countries have cities that are, are centers of their film industry or, or television industry. And, and again, you go to where the decisions are made and you try and get in that room. That's, that's the safest strategy. There it is. Uh, speaking of streaming giants, Netflix, you held the station of director of original series production for Netflix. How did that come about? And what did you do during your time there? Um, this was about four years ago. And so Netflix had, had decided, uh, I mean, those people are geniuses. I mean, they really, Ted Sarandos, Cindy Holland, um, just understood not only what they wanted to do, but what the responses were going to be from the studio. So in the beginning, everything was licensed. Uh, they would obtain the rights to things to put on the show. And, but they understood that if, if they achieved a certain size, the studios were gonna go, well, wait a second, we're kind of getting left out of the biggest uh, profit loop here. So we're not gonna sell to you anymore. So to, to do that, there needed to be a lot of original production started up very, very quickly uh, at Netflix. And uh, that sounded like, and was an incredibly exciting place to work as uh, this, as, as the new paradigms take place. Look, streaming's taking over. The networks are uh, fighting a very uh, defensive losing game uh, in terms of quality of their creative product. People would just rather watch shows whenever they want to watch them on whatever they want to watch and without commercials. And uh, that's just an unbeatable combination. So I don't think that the networks are going to, to survive as uh, scripted series buyers in quite the way, I mean, they were exclusive to the market uh, until very recently. Netflix, um, and the other streamers are, are just going to uh, have eaten their lunch. And uh, now the question, the real question is, is theatrical distribution going to survive um, the combined onslaught of streaming competition and COVID uh, limits on the audience? So I think that that's pretty much in doubt. The way I view that, by the way, is... Look, most of us know how to cook. 
when I say everybody knows how to cook and I'm in a group of millennials, they're, they're shaking their heads in fear that they would have to cook. But most of us know how to cook. And yet we go out to restaurants when we wanna have a special experience. Movies for as a function of convenience and cost have positioned themselves now as special experiences. When you wanna have that experience, you'll go there. You won't necessarily make that decision based on whether or not it's playing at home because you can always make a hamburger at home, but McDonald's seems to be doing pretty well. Yeah. So I, I do see some, some changes there. So anyway, it was an exciting, exciting uh, almost year. Uh, there's a lot of turnover at Netflix. Can you guess why that is? I mean, you're no longer there. Oh, well, it's the same reasons there. It's a Silicon Valley culture and they, they, they have published what their culture is and their culture is if you're doing a satisfactory job, they will offer you a severance package. You have to be extraordinary at all times. They just, they just, they, they pay extremely well and uh, they demand a tremendous amount. And not everyone is a fit for that culture. It's quite demanding. Uh, it's, it can be quite, uh, quite difficult to, to navigate it. It's also a very different culture than the Hollywood culture. You know, Hollywood is, is you know, uh, the, the joke is that you, you can tell your friends in Hollywood because they're the ones who stab you in the front. And in Netflix, everybody's a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is hiding anything. Whereas in Hollywood, you, you, you would probably tendency would not be to be as confrontative as, as, or confrontive as, as they are, uh, as an everyday occurrence. The other thing is Netflix knew that they had a very limited amount of time to get a tremendous amount of product in front of viewers to, to shift the allegiance from networks and, and pay cables to, to streaming. And um, what I discovered is I'm pretty, pretty efficient, uh, but watching over more than a dozen shows at a given time didn't allow me to do what I thought was my special sauce uh, for a show, which was to, to maximize it and to make sure that it was doing the best it could. I could only put in line producers uh, and pretty much then have to walk away uh, from, from the show, barring certain sets of problems that might come up. And that wasn't as, as much fun for me or satisfying for me as, as the other, uh, as doing deep dives into a show, which is what I like to do. Does that mean that that's what you're back to? I mean, I know we've been hit for the bulk of this year by not being able to do anything, but what are you doing now? Uh, right now, I've, I've done like three or four pilots since I left uh, Netflix, so that kept me busy. Uh, I am usually kept busy with, a com uh, with consulting, teaching, and by consulting, I'm given pilots by the studios and asked to evaluate uh, production plans or to develop production plans for how to do those shows. Um, uh, I get a lot of scripts to read for, for notes and um, actually writing a script. So that's kind of fun too. You heard it, everyone. Be on the lookout. Um, in terms of writing, uh, you know, there's a lot of budding screenwriters in New Mexico, especially with all the film schools. Uh, can you give one, one big mistake that budding screenwriters are making? I mean, you're seeing a lot of these scripts come up over your desk, you're, you're, you're analyzing, what's a big thing that young writers are mistaking? Well, I think that, let's talk about the process because that's gonna be, I think, most helpful. I think that the biggest mistake beginner writers make is to not fully create a detailed outline of the project that they're going to do that they'll just go, I've got it all in my head and I will start writing it. And the way you can tell you've made that mistake is you get to about the middle of the second act and it's, you know, you've, you just not fitting in together. So you go back to the beginning and you start rewriting and that loop stays endless because you don't have a pathway 
to complete the show. Uh, you don't really have your act beats out there and it's not there. All I can say is I will, you know, Vince Gilligan is, is the greatest writer I've, I've worked with in, in drama. If Vince Gilligan has to make, put everything on three by five or in his case, four by six cards and have it in front of him so that he can see the breakdown of every episode, then for me not to do it would just be ridiculous. And so really being detailed about the outline. The other thing is being really clean and clear about the, the writing, uh, what you're doing. Uh, a screenplay is not a novel. It is a blueprint. It is a blueprint for a movie. It is a blueprint for a house. So it's really important that everybody who's pounding a nail knows where those nails are supposed to go and how they're to be interpreted. So you write for the reader because that's the person who's just going to pass the recommendation on up for you. And you make sure that, that you're just really clear uh, so that the, as that writer is, is reading through the script, it's not a slog for them. It's a, a joy to go from sentence to sentence and from image to image. So I would say putting in a tremendous amount of description is disruptive. Um, you know, certainly there is no excuse for not formatting correctly. There's just none because the programs will do 95% of that for you. So, uh, you know, don't, don't be stupid and hand in something that looks like it was done by a high schooler, a bad high schooler. Um, you know, don't make proofread your, your project. I know it sounds Mickey Mouse, but recognize that I don't know how many scripts get registered with the Writers Guild every year, 20, 30,000. You're in competition with every one of those. Hmm. So why would you hamstring yourself and hand in a, a rush work? The other thing is you only have one time to make a first impression. Do not hand a professional a script that isn't ready to be sold. If you are looking for, for notes, that's something different um, to, to understand who can give you notes and how notes really happen is an important subset. Um, but sometimes writers aren't prepared for that. I just, uh, you know, the work on sitcoms really informed me that, you know, we would start uh, rehearsal typically on a Monday and we would shoot on a Friday. But between that Monday and that Friday, although we started with a finished script, supposedly, it would be completely rewritten four times by, by Friday. Well, so don't tell me that your stuff is etched in stone. Right. Because it's not. And, and understand that sometimes changes are necessary, but you know, it's the lesser talented writers who are most resistant to suggestions. The, the, the talented people know that they're gonna be able to make something good. Um, I recently finished a project where, where literally a big part of it had not been figured out, but the writer who was extremely experienced and a very nice person said, you know what, I've faced challenges like this before. I know I'm gonna figure this out. So let's, let's get all the cards on the table as to what we need and I'll, I'll, I'll build it from there. And he was right, so that's good. <clears throat> a little bit of ego playing into that, right? I mean, ego can be, can be the downfall of, of talent there. I'm gonna try and segue from ego into the statement, talk is cheap. I know that's a self-explanatory uh, notion there, but apply that to your line of work. What does that mean to you in your line of work? Talk is cheap. I know it's open-ended there, but I mean, what do you think of? What do you think of in your industry when you hear that? Well, it's, it's kind of um, a Zen thing in the sense that when somebody says, we're gonna make a movie, what have they said? They've just said, we're gonna make a movie. Making the movie is something, a different activity. So you, you have to take everything at its, at its core statement. Uh, having a great meeting is not getting to the next step. You've had a great meeting. You just have to, to take things for what they are 
And uh, when people commit, uh, that's not cheap talk. So you have to respect that and um, move forward. But I don't find anything cheap in making a TV show or movies. <laughs> it's very expensive. And the meter's always running. And the meter's always running. Uh, I'm going to give you one more for a few audience questions here. Um, you've said, show business is a mixture of technology, creativity, and business. You have to understand all aspects of the process, as well as the different kinds of people who do them in order to get the best possible show on the screen, which I think you've demonstrated here. Uh, what do you do when people don't meet your expectations in terms of efficiency, quality, and vision? Well, first thing is to, to, to frame, I mean, is there a specific problem you're dealing with? If there's a specific problem, I think it's incumbent on any manager to try and get a perspective, uh, more than one perspective on what's causing the problem. Uh, you know, they, there's always two sides to two issues. So you really wanna make sure you identify uh, as best you can what the real issue here is. Then I think the, the next step is, you know, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a failure of experience or are we talking about a failure of personality or character? Failure of experience is, is pretty easy to, to, to deal with. I mean, in most cases now, you don't want your head stunt person <laughs> to have a failure of experience. You want to, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. you as a bad manager. Yeah. But, but, you know, insofar as I've talked about mentoring people and bringing them along, it's creating an environment where they can talk to people who have experience and understand that asking that question isn't going to mark them down in somebody's expectation. Certainly, again, uh, these are very highly charged interpersonal relationships on a set. And not all good hearted people get along with other good hearted people. So uh, there are times uh, where you have to make the change that is necessary for the production. And it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's not easy. I don't think I've ever just sort of like snapped ear, you know, fired that, that kind of ridiculous off with their heads kind of statement. Uh, I think that essentially you, you sit with the person and generally people know when it's not working out. And you give them a chance to talk about that. And then if, if that talk hasn't resolved the situation, you have to, to say to people, look, uh, you've done good work in the past. People have recommended you in the past or you wouldn't have been here. This is not working out for you. And we're going to stop our, our work relationship. And I can just hope that you will find yourself in a group that appreciates what you are bringing to the party. And so far as this is a lesson that you should learn, like you can't show up late. You can't, you can't be intoxicated. You know, you can't uh, come to the show unprepared uh, or not prepared at all. Um, that's, that's, those are just professional level behaviors that you generally because everybody is being hired for each project separately, hmm. there's no tenure in this business. You have to be as good on your last job as you were on your first job. And you have to treat it that way. Nobody, nobody gets to coast. So we're always being, uh, we're always having to deliver and we're always having to deliver as high as possible level as we can. It's just the nature of the business. You want secure, Okay, there are jobs that are, give you security. I mean, obviously uh, public sector jobs are very secure. And there are a lot of private sector jobs that are not quite as demanding as, as these jobs uh, are, both to do and also to maintain a career because you know, just getting one show is, is not a career. <laughs> Unless you wind up on, some, uh, on law and order and it's opening year, then, then it's a career. Uh -huh. That's great. Okay. Well, that was a lot there, Stuart. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to transition into, uh, into a few audience questions here. Um, 
We've got Akira Sippler. Uh, what is your favorite genre and what kind of story did you gravitate toward? We all know it's not slasher. We know that's not resonating with you, but what do you resonate with? I like sci-fi a lot. Uh, I, I like coming of age stories a, a lot. I like historical uh, dramas a lot because they're a lot of fun to do. You know, you've got costumes and you've got sometimes horses and you've got, you know, just a lot of stuff to, cre to create. I like smart. I don't like stories about stupid people doing stupid things. Um, so, I, you know, when the characters uh, are good hearted, I, you know, it's, it was a lot of fun to work on Breaking Bad and watch Walter White's transition from what he thought was a good person to what he wound up uh, being and to see who would come along in that. So I, I liked, I liked the complexity of that story. I like people who are real. Um, those are, those are the smart, things. That, smart, smart, smart content. Yeah. 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 Um, question from Mark Comstock, who's our sag after president here in New Mexico. Uh, Mr. Stewart, how much growth did you see from New Mexico talent from Breaking Bad season one to the last season? Well, I think it's tremendous. Um, I think first off, we were creating a, a venue for people to come to to display their talent. Uh, we had terrific uh, local casting in both extras and in some of the smaller roles. M many of the bigger roles were cast uh, out of Los Angeles or in New York, but uh, a tremendous number of roles were cast locally. Um, and we preferred to cast locally whenever possible. Uh, but what the casting was always done relatively blind to anything except the talent uh, of the person involved uh, and the talent of the person and how well they, they, they fit the role. But there were some just tremendously wonderful, authentic people who became uh, available to us because they, they were trying out and, and they were doing things. So, as other shows came in, the pool of people expanded. Um, every show, I'm sure, discovered its own uh, pool of talent. And then, you know, people watch other people's shows and get me that guy, get me that lady, get me that that person. So you, you would see people in, uh, we had a, a little boy on our show who wound up uh, doing, oh gosh, what was that show um, about the assassin? But he wound up going over to that. Show. And anyway, it just kept it kept growing. So yes, there was a there was a growth as I think the opportunities increased uh, for people to do work. Perfect. What thematic takeaway from the show Breaking Bad? Not the production itself, but thematic takeaway or lesson did you take away from Breaking Bad? Don't do meth. Um, Don't do meth. <laughs> That's good. That's good. It's a horrible drug. Uh, what did I take away? What I took away was that this was a show that Vince Gilligan did at the highest creative level. And that really demanded that all of us uh, play tennis at a higher level. It wasn't about just getting it done. It was about getting it done really, really well. Um, and there were people working extremely hard at every level to make that happen. Um, the, the writers, uh, the directors, obviously some of the other, all of the other producers, just, I mean, people just wanted to not let Vince down, not let the project down. And uh, it was lightning in a bottle for the seasons that we did it. All right, I, I think the, you've spoken in terms of caliber of Breaking Bad and, and the mark of quality that you were aiming for, you often use the word film, movie, like you were shooting a movie mm -hmm. for every episode. And, and I think just that mindset is already putting you in, a, in the mode to do good work, lasting work, not just a flavor yeah, it wasn't, of the week kind of thing. You know? It wasn't a flavor of the week. It wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't formulaic. Uh, it, 
it's certainly there were shows that were serialized dramas, serious serialized dramas before Breaking Bad, uh, not the least of which was The Wire and Sopranos preceded us. But I think that the scope of what we tried to do uh, really reset the, the possibilities for television. And it wasn't just TV. This was a single story told over, well, 62 episodes, which is basically about 50 hours. Uh, and because we had that big canvas to paint with, we were able, and Vince was able to guide a show through a level of density and complexity that I don't think had been seen before in, in quite that, that way. Uh, the cinematography, Michael Slovis was just brilliant. Um, and New Mexico itself, which had been, I mean, hadn't been seen a lot. Uh, right. So we were really able to take advantage of the unique light, uh, a lot of the unique settings to, to tell our story. And uh, it just, uh, Vince always said, we're, we're shooting a Western. And so he, he wanted that scope. But if you were doing this for network television, they would have said, I don't understand. Everybody's this big on the screen. Why are they so small? They wouldn't have gotten it. And frankly, they also wouldn't have understood the um, fact that we expected people to um, really pay attention. We knew people were watching it over and over again. Okay. And so we didn't have to do the kind of dialogue of, so what you're really saying is, or uh, remember back when Susie had her birthday? Well, no, Susie had her birthday last episode. We don't have to remember back. We just, he just assumed an intelligent, committed audience. And, smart television. And smart television. Well, I'm not saying all television is smart, but the people who saw that and were inspired by that, right. writing some really great TV. After uh, commenting on your, your affinity for science fiction, we have a Jerry Jazz who's saying, do you see sci-fi as an avenue for social comment? Of course, absolutely. Favorite sci-fi movie, Stuart? Oh, favorite one? Hmm. Uh, Alien, the original. Alien, smart sci-fi. Okay, okay. Um, also the, the first Terminator. Really? Oh, first yeah. First Terminator. First Terminator, first Alien. Um, I mean, the social commentary. Go, go check out Battlestar Galactica. Uh, the, not the original, <laughs> which was a cartoon. But the, the at least three seasons of that show, that show went on, in my opinion, a little too long. I don't think the ending was as, as satisfactory as I would have liked to have seen. But the first three seasons were just brilliant and made a lot of commentary uh, on what it means to be human uh, at, at the center post of, of the show. And I, I thought it was just remarkable and wonderful and, and, and deep on a level that uh, most other science fiction TV shows at least have not been able to uh, replicate. Talking about a deep level, we also have, what do you think about surrealism? Yeah. In, 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 a, in a movie? Let's say in art. Yeah, let's I'm, say film television. I'm not as much a fan of surrealism as I am of impressionism. So you want, you ask the question, guys, that's a, that's an answer right there. You know, I, I've, you know, it's surrealism. The, the issue with surrealism is, is what does it need to, to, to do to evoke an emotional response? And typically, you know, when you look at stuff like Dolly's stuff, it's the shock value that, that is grabbing about the image, the uh, looking into people's bodies or, you know, just the distortion of clocks and things like that. It isn't so much uh, the true, deeper, complex human emotions going on there. So that, that's my take on surrealism. Not exactly something I'm asked every day. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um... 
you have a favorite episode of Breaking Bad? If yes, what was that? What was it about that episode that made it your favorite? I, I think the episode uh, Ryan Johnson directed it. I was just about to bring that one up in terms of surreal. I'm well, not surrealism, but continue, please. Uh, the third to the last episode, um, Ozymandias. Um, um, uh, just, I thought, was the single best one hour of television that I've ever seen. Uh, in terms of pilots, the Breaking Bad pilot was the best pilot that I've seen. Uh, in terms of establishing a show, in terms of introducing us to characters and making us want to continue to see the show. I had fun on a lot of episodes. I had nightmares on a lot of episodes. Um, the train episode was intensely demanding and really um, was very difficult to produce, but uh, we had a great team working on it. Uh, it, just, it just took everything we had to pull it off. And then of course the ending. You know, the last episodes, but they're, they were memorable episodes every, every year, mm -hmm. many memorable, much more than most shows. Um, now, what would you say to someone who has, because I know many who, who've shied away from watching Breaking Bad because of content? Watch the pilot. That's it. You don't have to watch three episodes in order to get into it. Watch the pilot. And, uh, it's not, you know, it's really not a show to me. I don't think of it as a show about dealing drugs. I think of it as a show about one man's, one man's curious path to understanding who he really is in life and and the disaster that that proves when he's, when he's lying to himself and lying to those he thinks he loves. I think that that's the, the arc of the show for me. Segue here. That was very nice, Stuart. I Thank you. That. that was very nice. Uh, when do you know when your story is ready to be sold or needs another draft? You know. You know. But you have, you cannot fool yourself. Um, if you have a script and you think it's, it's really ready, um, you need to get it to people who understand what a script needs to be. And you also need to know how they're going to be looking at it. You can't hand a script to most agents and expect a literary critique. When they're looking at your script, they are, should be thinking, can I sell this? That's, that's their focus. That's why they're there for you. Can they sell what you've given them? That's different than making a good script. That's a sellable script. When you're handing it to a, a knowledgeable teacher, they're trying to make sure you can do the best you can, or they should be. Uh, and they should be guiding you to that. When you hand it to friends, what do your friends know? Sometimes you can hand it to your friends and just what you can do is do a clarity test. You know, do you understand what I'm doing here? Did it, did it hold you all the way through? And then if they say, oh, well, you know, I, I think this character is wrong over here. Listen to that. Don't correct the character. But if everybody says, I think Tommy should be taller, I think Tommy should be shorter, I think that Tommy really needs to be uh, a woman, I think that Tommy, you know, is this, I think Tommy's that. Don't follow their recommendations. Just understand, you have a problem with Tommy. Right. Everybody's pointing at Tommy. So understand how notes come about and the agenda, conscious or not, of the person reading the script. But when you hand it to somebody to buy, then, then you need to sort of say, if I were in their shoes and I was reading this script, would I buy it? And if I did buy it, could I do something with it? Because it's nice to have your stuff purchased, but if the person who's buying it can't do anything with it, it's gonna go on a shelf and, and, and stay there. And that's, that's basically 
you know, th that's the advice on, on scripts in a nutshell. Do you still recommend, uh, you've said before, to, uh, you know, a show that's going to be on the air four or five years, write a, write a, write an episode of that and start pitching that around or, or work of work off of it like that to, to, to hone your skills. I mean, is that something still relevant? Oh, I think it's still relevant. I mean, yes, everybody wants to get something brilliant and original and, and things like that, but here's, here's, here's the, the metaphor on that. Imagine if you were an architect and you wanted to have your, your plans purchased for, uh, somebody to build and they would go and they'd say, okay, what have you built before? I haven't built anything. Well, then how can I trust that if I give you $5 million to do this TV pilot that it's going to turn out well? And if, if it does turn out well, how can I be sure that you're going to be able to build another hundred homes? Because, you know, it's not that Vince wrote a great and brilliant pilot, which he did. He also supervised or wrote 62 other episodes or 61 right. episodes to tell that story. So just, just understand that there's a tremendous amount of money and time and people's reputations at stake uh, with every decision. And you need to, to understand that and honor it uh, and serve it with what you're doing. I mean, with how much you know about you know, writing and directing and all the things you've seen. I mean, you're talking about writing a script or is this something you might eventually transition into? I mean, will you let aside the behind the, well, not behind the camera, but the more creative side of things? Is that something you want to do? At, at this point in, in my career, I would be insanely fortunate to land on anything that approached breaking that. If I, I do go on to something, I managed to talk myself into thinking that that's the case because I just you just have to give everything to the show that you're on and if you can't do that you should stop uh, I'm whether or not I wind up on another show is a kind of a function of of the COVID crisis it's a function of of what shows are available um, I spent almost nine years on distant location away from family right uh, that's not something I'm going to be repeating. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd come to various places. Uh, New Mexico would be one of them. But, uh, I'm, you know, I've been doing it a tremendously long period of time at a pretty high level. And, and if more stuff happens, great. And if not, I'll go where things are interesting to me. Um, I enjoy doing these kinds of conversations. Uh, I'll be speaking at the Seattle Film uh, uh, Festival, I think in a couple of weeks in DePaul University, a, a few weeks after that. Uh, there's some discussion about me teaching in a couple of other universities. So that part is is a lot of fun for me right now. The screenwriting, screenwriting is great. I've, I've written about a dozen features, I've sold three. Um, you know, whether that gets to be a full-time uh, mm -hmm. Do it at this point. I mean, yes, there are other ideas I'd like to write, but uh, you know, this is this is an interesting time. Yeah, it is. Are you looking forward to getting back on the slopes? I hear from Ann Lerner that you are the most incredible skier, which is not something I would have thought. I thought you've been working the whole time, but I mean, is that a love of yours? Is that a passion? Yes, I'd love to get back, and I'd love to go skiing with Ann. We would uh, head up to Taos and. Uh, and uh, that's a great mountain to to enjoy so yeah good old taos um well <clears throat> Stuart, let's see if i can end with this i mean what uh what are you looking forward to in the industry i know there's been a lot of of trends that have developed or just overall industry developments that might be negative. I mean, is there, is there a, is there a hope that you have or something that you're looking forward to? I mean, it's a very questionable time in the industry, all the streaming. This is a very busy this, question, this is, but. I think this is the most exciting time in history to be part of television. I don't think it's the most exciting time to be part of feature films. I think that was, that era was the seventies, eighties and the early nineties. I think this is the best time in history to be part of TV. I think that the stories that can be told and the way that they're telling them, and certainly, you know, shows like Insecure are just wonderful 
wonderful glimpses, Rami, uh, into other people's lives and, and it just helps understanding. I find them incredibly uh, moving. I, I, look, what we do in the shadows is fun. Uh, these, these are really well done shows by top creative people. So I enjoy watching them. And uh, if I'm given the opportunity, I enjoy working with them to, to make them happen. So I think that we are heading for uh, finally uh, an improvement in inclusiveness. I think that the, the situation with directors has been disgraceful for a long time. Uh, I've worked with a lot of very talented women directors and, I, and they've had a hard, hard road to crack. Uh, there are still, you, you know, crafts, craft unions that are difficult. Sometimes you might even say, well, you know, listen, we have to do a lot of heavy lifting. We're in the grip department uh, and we used to have to do even more heavy lifting um, in lighting and, you know, but notwithstanding that the equipment can be selected that doesn't present these issues in many cases. And uh, I'm looking for, for other voices to be, to be serviced. Um, I enjoy most of, most of the time I would have at least 50% of my crew uh, that I was responsible for hiring would be women. I worked with a lot of women as UPMs, as first ADs, as second ADs. I mean, that's my direct responsibility. And, and then oftentimes I've encouraged or facilitated other departments, say in camera and sound to find qualified people there, as well as the you know, more traditional crafts and makeup and hair and wardrobe. So, yeah, I mean, I, th I think this is, a, this is a, a great time, but uh, I don't, it's not a friendly, soft and cud cuddly business. Um, it is for some people, um, but they're in front of the camera. And even them, you know, we treat actors when they're starting their career so abysmally that it's quite understandable how some of them wind up so crazy. So there, there you are. Did you freeze? Nope. I freeze there, I think. Oh, we went all the way, Stuart, almost. I'm back. Are you back? Okay. There we are. Um, well, okay. I, I, uh, I think that's it, Stuart. I, I, th yeah. I, think, our, I think all of our people got their, their questions in. And questions in? All right, terrific. Stuart, I, I mean, this was very informative. And, and if you didn't already know, I mean, you are, are you and your work, you're very dear to us in New Mexico because you, I mean, you brought, you brought a culture to our state, you know, and we'll, and it's continuing into, into better call Saul. It's, it's maintaining that, that culture, two different shows, but, but a culture oh, all the same. Almost, uh, almost all the crew rolled over, rolled over. Wow. And as a matter of fact, that was one of the things I enjoyed most about being in New Mexico was that once we finally got our crew together, you know, kind of, it took two seasons, but once we were into our third season, I was able to, find work and bring entire shows in and tell them you can hire your cinematographer and a couple of other key people, your production designer, possibly your, uh, you know, certainly wardrobe, the key kind of key, those key people, but I'm going to give you everybody else. Everybody else. Yeah. And they would say, well, that's a problem. I said, no, no, it's the breaking bad crew. Never a problem. Never a problem. And I'm sure they're still feeling the effects of that here. Well, I, I, I'm sure so they are. Just terrific, uh, terrific uh, talent, and uh, and they were given, um, you know, they were given opportunities, and they rose to them, and it's just terrific. So there you go. Wonderful, Stuart. Well, uh, I wish you the best. We Thanks. all wish you on the best on, on what you have coming up. Uh, hope everything's safe with you and the family. Um, so far. For everyone tuning in, if you want to stay in the Breaking Bad Saul uh, uh, mood, we do have Giancarlo Esposito coming up with another conversation soon. So, you know, not saying, but saying. Uh, Stuart, get back to it. Work hard, and we look Thank forward to seeing what's coming next.
Thank All you. right. Great speaking with you guys. Bye-bye.